So a bit of background about this masterclass. In March, art schools around the world started to close and we reached out to volunteers to support teachers and students in developing new skills during this time. And we got fantastic offers from all over the world and we started setting up connections between these volunteers and our schools. But there were certain volunteers who thought could give valuable guidance for a wider audience which is, and particularly all senior students, which is why we've started this masterclass series. So we're really excited that you're joining us for the very first presentation in this first series of masterclasses, which will deal with preparing for the world of work. We'd really appreciate your feedback and suggestions at the end of the call. There'll be a box where you can give us kind of an anonymous rating, and we'll also provide an email address um, in case you want to give any more in-depth feedback. So our first Prince presenter that's joining us today is Leandro Margulis, who is an Arts Argentina alum and a successful entrepreneur in the field of business development and is currently based in San Francisco. And I'm sure Leandro will tell you a bit more about himself um, when he presents in just a moment. Uh, but he's also a, an Art lay leader and he's helping to build the future leadership of Art. So when we hand over to Leandro, he's going to share his screen. And if you have any questions, please use the chat box and we'll address these questions during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And there'll also be a chance to unmute yourself and ask a question later on. So um, Leandro, would you like to say hello and, and I'll hand over to you. Hello, everybody. Super excited to, to be with you today. Um, and share a little bit of what I learned so far, and hopefully you find it helpful in, in these unique times. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, uh, and hopefully you guys can see it, please confirm. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Perfect, awesome. Very glad to, very glad to, to hear that. So cool. So today I'm going to tell you, you know, we're living in a unique uh, world in the new normal uh, with uh, COVID uh, sheltering in place, some places starting to open. Uh, if you are a senior at some of the art schools, you're probably looking at next steps. Some of the next steps may be school, some of the next steps may be work. And um, so uh, networking is as important, if not more, uh, and ever sometimes it's not only what you know, you have done a great job getting here in terms of getting all the content and making the most of your experience at ORT. But sometimes it's also about uh, not only what you know, but who you know and how you can get to know the people that you need to know. So it, those have been some of my, my life learning. So I'm gonna go a little bit through that. Uh, and first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. So um, in case you are wondering where I'm from, uh, you know, uh, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about me, but basically I, I am originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina, born and raised there. I spent the first 20 years of my life there. I went to the Ort High School in Argentina. Uh, I studied computer science, uh, loved the system thinking and problem solving, uh, but also didn't want to be in front of the computer all the time. So I ended up uh, choosing afterwards not to continue in computer science, but to, to do industrial and systems engineering. The joke there is that they say engineers make things and industrial engineers make things better in the sense that it's all about improving uh, business processes and manufacturing processes and so on and so forth. Um, I got a chance. Uh, so there was a big turmoil in Argentina in the early 2000s, you know, another one of the crises. Uh, there's usually one every decade or 12 years or so. Um, and at that point, I, I moved to what, what I call the, the capital city of South America, Miami, Florida. Uh, so that's where I finished my industrial and systems engineering studies for university. Um, I had a chance to do my first internship, internship at a company called General Electric that you may know from the light bulbs, even though they don't do light bulbs anymore. Uh, but I, I was working in the manufacturing of locomotives in Erie, Pennsylvania. And there I realized that I was more into information management than operations management. Uh, during my last year of engineering, I worked at Oracle in Miami, working for a group called Oracle Direct, doing pre-sales consulting for Latin America. And I was an engineer doing some kind of business stuff. So I realized that I was missing some of the business stuff that was going on around me. And so I decided that eventually I wanted to do an MBA. And as a good engineer, I thought, well, what's the most efficient way to get the most work experience 
in the least amount of time, I ended up in management consulting. I worked at Deloitte Consulting uh, for a couple of years, first implementing Oracle ERP systems for other companies, uh, and then uh, moved to strategy. I actually got a chance to, uh, I mean, all, one of the other reasons I chose Deloitte is because uh, in theory they pay for the MBA. Um, once that came up, it was, I, I could choose for a list of schools that Yale was not there, but then I got something that I never knew existed. It was a full tuition scholarship to Yale. Uh, and it was an amazing experience uh, for two years there. I started my own company uh, during the second year of business school called Tracetag in the IoT space, RFID, radio frequency identification. Um, I got the entrepreneurial back from there. I wanted to move to Silicon Valley, San Francisco, the Bay Area. I was trying to figure out the best way to do so. Deloitte gives me another offer uh, to move to San Francisco. And there I was, uh, I was helping tech companies in the Bay Area. Uh, then uh, I ended up helping small companies from Latin America uh, with a program like a mini Deloitte helping companies that got to a certain revenue plateau get to the next level. Um, I love that. I find consulting very intellectually stimulating, but I'm also an engineer. I'm a builder. I wanted to be part of building stuff. And I felt like consulting was a little bit more tangential to Silicon Valley and I wanted to be in it. So I ended up at a couple other companies, including my own uh, in Silicon Valley, right? I mean, uh, Quixi was a search engine for apps. I was the first senior business person um, and employee number 50 before Series B. Uh, and, uh, you know, we raised over three rounds of funding, B, C, and D, $150 million from SoftBank and Alibaba. Uh, we grew to almost 400 people in two and a half years from 50. Uh, and then we went crashing down, learned a lot of lessons about what to do and what not to do. Then I started my own company, uh, helping people that currently have a job, get a new job without messing up their current job situation. Uh, that was a great experience as well. Um, and then I actually started helping other companies, uh, uh, companies like Sint and TomTom that are companies from Europe, create their business unit in Silicon Valley. Sint, I helped them create a new data business and monetize it. TomTom is the company that created the GPS devices. Every time I say TomTom, people make that, uh, that shape. And it's, yeah, it's a GPS devices, but I helped them compete with Google Maps. Um, and lately I've been helping uh, another startup called Unify ID that basically helps uniquely identify people based on behavioral myometrics, like the way you walk. Why am I telling you all this? And um, it's just in case you're in different stages of, of your life and trying to think through stuff about how you're, how think, how you're thinking about the next step, happy to follow up after um, and, and, and help out in any way I can. So as you see, I moved from Argentina to Miami, Florida, and then I slowly moved west. Uh, my first stint at Deloitte was in Cleveland, Ohio. Then I moved to New Haven, Connecticut for business school, and then I ended up in San Francisco. So I've been in San Francisco for over a decade now. So enough about me. Um, what I want to tell you is a little bit more about the lessons that I learned regarding networking uh, that apply both to apply both to the digital and, and analog life, uh, but you can definitely apply them to tools like LinkedIn, uh, but also in person if and when <laughs> we can start going to in-person events again. So the reality is when I moved from Argentina to Miami, I didn't know anybody. And I felt like I was falling behind. Everybody had their own friends from their own high school uh, and they were kind of hanging out in their own groups from people that they knew from ever, forever. And then something interesting happened. Uh, I, there were a lot of people because it was a big mess in the early 2000s in Argentina. There were some people that I knew from Ort and from Argentina that had moved to Miami. So I was hanging out in that cluster of people on one hand. Then I had my own cluster of people from school, right? I mean, from FIU. Then I also was very active in the Jewish community. Then I also became active in the Ort chapter uh, in Florida. So I realized that a lot of people were, they needed things that they couldn't find in their own cluster of people. And they actually ended up asking questions. And then I happened to know, for example, if somebody needed, uh, if somebody in the ORT uh, chapter that were usually older people needed some help with computers, I would find somebody in my engineering group from school that could help them. But they wouldn't know if it wasn't for me because like those ORT people would hang out in their own cluster. So what I realized is that uh, while people have strong networks, they tend to hang out within the same group of people. And 
the reality is that the weakest link becomes the strongest link. The weakest link within a cluster, in this case, it was me, uh, I ended up being the strongest link to another cluster. So I ended up becoming a connector between clusters and people ended up coming to me when I ended up becoming the go-to person when they needed something. And they, they were wondering things that they couldn't find from their typical group of people. So that ended up, that ended up being a very interesting lesson for me to learn because uh, I realized that I could add value to different networks, even though I didn't know anybody when I first came in. Um, this is not an easy thing. You need to be active. You need to be cognizant to be active in more than one group of people. And you end up not being as deep in one of those groups. So this could be your mission if you choose to do so. And if it's not your mission, that's fine. But it, it will be good for you to know who are these links between clusters. So when you need something, you know who to go to. So that was a big learning uh, for me that has helped me throughout my career. Um, and in business development, this becomes crucial, uh, making sure that you can make connections for partnerships and also making sure that you can put yourself in the shoes of somebody else and have that empathy and understand where they're coming from. Uh, so that resonates with, with people. And you can see this working very clearly in uh, social networks like LinkedIn, where you have different connections, first degree, second degree, uh, and depending on the size of the networks and different circles of people. Uh, that you connect more and more with. So this is not easy. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Um, this meant that I was going to a lot of different networking events and meetups at night. Uh, so it's not for everybody, but it's good to know who within your network is this kind of person. And when you're making these connections, you need to be careful that you don't look too utilitarian and too transactional because the connections need to be genuine and you need to genuinely care. So I put together a quick summary of the, of the five things. Uh, when you, if, if this is your mission, if you choose to move forward with this, uh, uh, for you to make the most out of it. And this can apply to you going to certain events um, physically or also online to webinars or the different kind of Zoom like uh, conferences that are happening. So, First thing, it's not easy, but it's good to get outside of your comfort zone. If there's a topic that you're interested in, but you're not sure, you know, just find the right venue, uh, virtual or physical. And you know, even if it's outside of your comfort zone, go and check it out. See who's there, what do they read, uh, what kind of topics people are interested in. When you engage in a conversation, make sure that you're actively listening so you can actually listen for cues about how you can help. Uh, usually when I'm, when I'm engaging in a conversation for the first time with somebody, I'm already thinking as I'm listening to them, who I can connect them with that could be a good connection for them. And it may come off a little rear at the beginning, but then people understand that you're coming from a good place and that you're trying to add value. And uh, the good thing is once you make a couple of meaningful connections, then your credibility and trustworthiness with that person increases and, and you become a trusted advisor to them. If you're going to certain events and or you know what kind of people you're, what kind of people you're interested in or you know specific people you want to meet, it's good to identify your targets before the, the event. Usually, when you subscribe to an event, you can ask sometimes for the attendee list, and you can do a little bit of research and homework and understand a little bit more about who they are and what you would like to talk to them about. And then, when you attend the event, you can actually go and meet them and explain why you want to meet with them and why you want to connect with them. And that usually works and people feel flattered because you actually did your homework and you really care about meeting them. As I said before, this should not be something transactional. You should genuinely care. If not, people can see it. And if, if you don't really care, uh, you know, people are gonna, are, are gonna just put you off. It, it, it doesn't work. And last but not least, I, I met a lot of people that at the beginning were like, oh my God, I worked so hard to build this network. I wanna keep it to myself. And then I'm like, well, what's the point of building a network if, if you're not sharing it, right? Um, in the spirit of educating and elevating, uh, the idea is to elevate everybody else around you as well. So if you can build a good network that you can share with other people, you can elevate everybody around you. And it also helps to build your own profile, your own reputation, your, your own trustworthiness, and your credibility as a trusted advisor. So great segue to building credibility and becoming a trusted advisor. So now that I told you a little bit about the, the thinking behind it, I wanna tell you a couple other tactical things to, to be aware of um, that once again, they work for both analog and digital life. 
So I'm gonna go through what a double opt-in intro is and why is that important? Why counterpart recommendations are important and how they, uh, they manifest themselves uh, in this world that we live, in this five-star world that we live in when we rate everything. And when we're shopping for something, we look at Amazon reviews and when you get into a share card service, uh, you rate that service as well. And then I'm gonna leave you with uh, some thoughts on lack and serendipity. So double opt-in intro, what is this? Um, there's three people uh, in this case, person A, B, and C. I will be person B uh, in this case. Usually, let's say, um, yeah, let's say that Daniel wants me to introduce him to Shoshana, right? Uh, usually, how, how would that usually go? Daniel would come and tell me, hey, Leandro, I see that you're connected to Shoshana, or uh, I mean, do you know Shoshana? I would love to connect with her. Uh, can you make that intro? And then usually people would go and just make that intro. Either if you are at a networking event or in physical, you would just grab Daniel and take him to Shoshana and be like, hi, <laughs> and introduce him. Or online, you would just send an email to both of them. But what is the problem with that? The problem with that is basically I have devalued my relationship with Shoshana. And, and it, it, there's, no, there's no guarantee that, that that connection would happen. I made a connection to Shoshana that shows randomly out of thin air. She doesn't have any context. She may be busy and may not be able to respond. So I put Shoshana in a pickle because if Shoshana says, if Shoshana doesn't answer, she doesn't look good. It's like, you know, she's very rude, she didn't answer. But on the other hand, I also devalued my relationship with Shoshana because I just sent her an email out of the blue asking for some of her time. So instead of doing that, uh, I, I'm an advocate of the double opt-in intro. It puts a lot more work on Daniel, who, which is fair because he's the one that wants the intro. It puts a little bit of more work on me, uh, but it actually creates a much better relationship for everybody and increases everyone's, everyone's reputation. So if we were to follow this protocol for introductions, uh, as I said, either in physical or digital life, um, the way it would work is the following. Daniel will ask me for the introduction and I will say, thank you for asking. Yes, I know Shoshana. Uh, can you draft a, or can you either tell me a little bit more about why you want to meet Shoshana or can you draft me an email to tell me why you want to meet Shoshana? So that puts a lot of the work on Daniel. Daniel will need to tell me why he wants to meet Shoshana. And then what I will do is I'm going to forward Shoshana that request for her consideration. And then if she says yes, I will make the connection. And if she says no, that's fine too. Because usually because I have a relationship with Shoshana, she will probably tell me no and tell me why no. So at least I can give Daniel some feedback about why Shoshana is saying no. And if she says yes, because I already have talked to both of them in advance, the connection is much more likely to happen and they both have the context. So not only that, but that, create, that creates a better perception of me in Shoshana's mind because I'm being respectful of her time um, and you know, I'm trying to make a meaningful connection and recommendation to her. So hopefully that makes sense. It probably, takes, uh, it probably takes a lot more time on Daniel. It takes a couple more minutes of my time uh, and one more iteration, but it creates a much better uh, communication for everybody. And it creates, it, it shows that you're much more, it gives the perception of everybody that you're more, much more mature and professional. So if you're looking for connections in this unique time uh, for your next job opportunity, this could be a good way to, to interact with people as well. Happy to uh, answer questions afterwards. I don't know if you're, I cannot see the chat yet, but if there's any questions, happy to answer uh, at the end of the presentation. The other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, building credibility and counterpart recommendations. I copy pasted um, a LinkedIn recommendation that I got from someone here. And as I said, we live in a world right now that it's all about reputation and five stars. And if you don't have five stars, it's a big problem. What is the equivalent of that in your professional life is recommendations. Uh, and this, as I said, applies to LinkedIn, but also applies to letters of recommendations, references on your, on your resume or CV, and so on and so forth. The reality, uh, one thing to think about, uh, the equivalent of the five-star reviews in an Amazon product or your Uber drive is a recommendation in professional life. And, it's great, how, do, how can you get recommendations that are also a little bit differentiated to what everybody else gets? So it's very important to get recommendations from your 
professors, from your uh, co-workers, counterparts, uh, people that reported to you, your managers, those are very important. But there's also another kind of, um, another kind of recommendation that is also very important and that can really, really help you stand apart. And it's counterpart recommendations. So in, in the world of work, for example, David in this case was a person that I worked with on the other side of the, of the table. I was at one company, he was at another company. We were negotiating, we were in different sides of the table and we were able to negotiate a deal that was a win-win situation. Not only that, we both changed companies at some point and we ended up working together again and creating more and more deals. And that says a lot to me because it's not only about somebody that, you know, it was your manager or, or that you manage, but it's also somebody that you were in the other side of the table and you were able to work together. So in the cases of, you know, students, if you have certain recommendations of people that, you know, other students that you work with on particular projects, uh, and these, these counterparts of yours are the ones that know you best because they, they're, they are with you in the trenches. So I, I think that those are very meaningful and can create a unique voice and tell a lot more about you. And there may be interview questions at some point that somebody's asking you, you know, what would others say about you? And having these kind of recommendations helps you answer those, answer those questions. All right. In terms of luck and serendipity, and I know this, this may look like empanadas, but they were supposed to be fortune cookies. So bear with me. All about the fortune, right? So uh, one phrase that I live by is, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Having been able to be active in all these different networks has helped me uh, in many different ways. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a couple of stories in terms of the more I have given to Ort, the more I have gotten to. So one of these companies that I work with called Quixie, for example, I got that role. Uh, thanks to being very active in the org chapter here in the Bay Area. Uh, other board members of mine were actually part of that startup and I ended up uh, working with them. You never know where these opportunities are coming from and if you, if you give, you get. Sometimes, as I say, it's not transactional. It doesn't come from the same person. Uh, but if you have a reputation of a giver, uh, you know, people want to give back and they play it forward. And it creates a virtual circle. Um, and the other concept is, you know, plan serendipity. Uh, you, you know, you, I go to an event and uh, the reason I go is to meet other people, right? And you don't know perhaps exactly who you're going to meet. Sometimes you know, sometimes you, you don't, but be open to great conversations happening. That's the reason people live in cities because there's a lot of interactions that can happen. That's one of the reasons I moved to Silicon Valley uh, to make sure that those opportunities happen. So with that, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, that's pretty much the wisdom I had to share with you today. Um, and with that, I want to open it for questions. Thank you very much, Leandro. That was a really great presentation. Great to hear about your experience. Um, we have some questions that have been sent in anonymously. Uh, so the first question is, uh, some people make out that they have good contacts with people that they barely know, so like pretending um, to have better connection. Is this acceptable in moderation or is it something that you should absolutely never do? Oh, so basically um, overselling your connections. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in, I think in moderation uh, is okay. Uh, I don't know if you heard the phrase, uh, but in the US it's, it's very common to say, fake it till you make it. And it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, I think that's, okay up to a point but you have to be very careful and you need to make sure that those connections actually work because you keep bothering about these connections and people ask you for a connection to these people and you cannot provide it then it's a problem right and then it actually uh, messes up your reputation as well what i can tell you about that is i'm for example on linkedin i'm connected to very high profile people that sometimes i don't know them that well so if you're asking for the double opt-in recommendation for example um Sometimes I don't know that person well, but I can say the, the following. I don't know this person well, but I know them well enough to forward a message for their consideration. And more often than not, I actually get an answer because the way I write that message is I'm being very respectful and considerate of their time. So it actually gives me an opportunity to, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense of building that connection further, right? So I, I think it's okay in moderation and it can actually help you. Uh, but you need to be, it's a delicate line. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question live, 
uh, please indicate either with a reaction or by raising your hand or just by unmuting yourself. <laughs> Well, um, hello, Leandro. Uh, I'm Tomas from Argentina too. I'm studying uh, electronic electric engineering, which is now mechatronics. It's kind of confusing what's ha what has happened in the old last. I don't know. Wh which campus years. are you in? Wh when you are in campus, which campus are you in? In Almagro. Okay, Satai. Super. All right, that's where I went. So yeah, um, I'm starting to develop a startup with some friends and we'll be presenting it to uh, an accelerator in some months. Um, what is the best advice you can give to someone who has to give a pitch about a technological startup related to like 3D printing that will just, it's like a, something that most people will miss. I don't know, something that like a detail that um, really matters to accelerators about startups well there there's a lot that matters and there's a lot of uh, the good thing is you have a lot of uh, a lot of readings about that and th there's a lot of material about that but just make sure like what what tends to happen um, and this is going to be a, a more uh, a, a bigger answer a longer answer but bear with me um, Usually coming from the background that, that, that we're coming, it's very engineering oriented and it's cool. And we get sometimes self-infatuated with the features and cool things that we can build. So just make sure that from a product perspective, your, your product is actually uh, the, the, the minimum viable product, the minimum features actually solve a, a, a customer problem and show that you understand the market and the use case that you're trying to fulfill. Uh, because if not, it, it, you, you get enamored with the with the technology or with the tool or with the solution you're building. Uh, but, you know, people are like, great, but so what? How does that help my problem? So make sure that you can put yourself in the shoes of the end customer, the end user, and, and make sure that what you're building is can actually solve a problem right now. And if not, if it's too many cool features, bells and whistles, make sure that you can tone it down uh, to an experiment that you can do. You're asking for money for an experiment that you can prove that you're solving a problem. That proving of solving that problem can help you then for that person to become that testimonial to get the next round of funding and so on and so forth. That's Hopefully great. that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, another question from uh, the anonymous chat. Uh, if you're in a small network or an industry where everyone knows each other, there are fewer opportunities to make and learn from your mistakes. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to relaunch yourself or can you advise what to do in that situation? So as you probably saw my first slide, I had many situations that I had to relaunch myself uh, in many different industries. Um, I, I think that there's a ton of opportunities. One, one of the problems that, that, that this person is describing is you're basically hanging out in the same cluster all the time. And I think that there's a lot of uh, your skill sets that can be transferred somewhere else. And there's a lot of skills from some other clusters that can be transferred where, uh, to where you are. So what, a couple of things that I've done when I've been in that situation. And I actually made a, made a point. And for, for example, when I was at, at ORT in, uh, in Argentina studying computer science, it was all about being in front of the computer all the time and coding. And I realized that, I, that there was more to me than that. So I made a conscious effort to be more active in the social sciences as well. And one of the things that I did is I became part of a, of a group called a Oral Archive that we traveled all around Argentina interviewing, uh, interviewing Jewish immigrants to Argentina about their experience. And a lot of them that went to art schools in the rural areas to have a profession to be able to work the land. Just, and there were a lot of learnings from that that from their experiences and from just traveling that I could apply even to computer science and to solve a function that I was stuck trying to solve. So I think just make a conscious, and, and for me what helped was making a conscious effort of going to other things. If I'm very active in a cluster and I'm very cognizant about the problems that are in that cluster, going to other clusters uh, that could help me educate myself, give me a breath of fresh air and actually inspire me for other ideas that can help me solve that. The, on the other hand, if you wanna get out of that cluster, um, you need to make sure that you can understand how your skills tr transfer somewhere else. And a lot of them do. I don't know exactly what this person does, but a lot of the skills transfer. Uh, and make sure that you can 
message that properly somewhere else. So you need to go where other people are, understand their language, what kind of literature they read, uh, and transfer translate the skills into uh, the new world. Uh, so uh, have the proper story about how uh, you can help and how your different perspective adds value. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions in the anonymous box, so I'll carry on reading these. Um, but please, anyone else who'd like to verbally ask, uh, make yourself known. Uh, so the next question is, uh, part of networking is about self-promotion. How do you find the balance between bigging yourself up and not coming across as arrogant or dislikable? So that goes a, lot, uh, a little bit to what we were talking about before, about bringing about your connections and so on. So usually when, I, uh, when, when I'm networking, I'm, it's all about the other person and, and then it ends up helping me. So it, it, is, it is selfish by being selfless. So it has been a lot about, you know, I talk to people and I'm trying to see how I can connect them with other people that can help them. Um, so, and that ends up elevating my reputation. So it's not about promoting myself, but I end up promoting myself and I end up becoming more trustworthy, more credible and a go-to person. So that has worked well for me and it has elevated all the people around me and it has been very rewarding in my life. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, so one person ask, it's asks, it sounds like you need to have a clear plan for what you want to do in your career and work. How much of your career moves were dependent on being in the right place at the right time? Okay, so uh, in, in, interesting. The way that the way that question is phrased shows you that it's not a clear path. Sometimes it's about being in the right place at the right time, and sometimes it's about plan serendipity, making yourself be in the right place at the right time. Honestly, yeah. It, when you look when you look backwards, it's easy to to show. Yeah, everything went so perfectly, but the reality is like it, it, it doesn't work like that at all. Right, and uh, there were many times that I had no idea what was next, and uh, there are many times that you don't know. Like I mean, if things didn't happen the way they happened in Argentina in the early 2000s, I wouldn't be uh, where I am today, for example. Who knows? I may still be in Buenos Aires, or if things uh, wouldn't be the way they are right now, there may be many startups that are getting started right now that may not be may not have been started. Right? I mean, so uh, for me, it, it, it's not that you have to have a clear path. You do need to know, you, need, you do need to have a, I would say, you need to have a compass, uh, but you also don't know what you don't know. So there were a lot of careers and professions that I had no idea what they were uh, until I went to business school. I didn't know how an investment banker uh, works. I didn't know how that, what that meant. Uh, I didn't know what management consulting was uh, before I got into Deloitte and you know, how that works. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you learn a, a, along the way. So I think you, it's good to have a plan uh, but you also need to be humble enough and open enough to append that plan and be open to what, what may happen. If not, you, you end up missing out on a lot of opportunities as well. Great, thank you. Um, next question. As a successful entrepreneur and business person, what are the key values or morals that you follow which you would never ever consider compromising on in your dealings? The, well, I mean, it's a deep question. No, it's a deep question. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot there, right? I mean, but I I always want to make sure that uh, my deals are kosher. Let's put it that way. Uh, no, I, I I always try to make sure that you know the deals are are value based. That it, it adds value to everybody. Um, and the reality is that uh, you you also you, as, as I said, all everything that I'm doing is trying to add value to to others because that builds my reputation and credibility. And if not, it comes to, it, it comes to bite you later because uh, if, you, if you do wrong by somebody and you know, the world is smaller and smaller in that sense in terms of the networks and clusters that we move in, uh, then it, like, that would really affect your reputation. And then you know how many times I have gotten uh, calls for character reference or reference about other people and I'm sure some other people got them about me uh, and I wanna make sure that people ca can say, uh, that I'm a good person because if not, uh, a lot of things don't move forward. So I do think that in the world that we live in, uh, going back to, to the slides in terms of the 
of the five star world. I, I, I think that reputation is everything. So, um, and in a way, I think that, that that helps us make sure that that people people keep being good, right? I mean, because reputation is everything, and you want to make sure that you, you you keep a good reputation. So I I would say uh, follow follow your values. Uh, make sure that what you're doing adds value to others, uh, and make sure that you're not only a taker but but a giver, and that helps elevate everybody, and uh, it will help elevate you as well. Okay, great. Um, so we're coming up to the last question now. So unless anyone has any last minute questions they'd like to send into the box, I do think this is quite a, a, an interesting one to end on. Uh, what are the pros and cons of online networking, i.e. LinkedIn, versus face-to-face? -face? So um, I, I think that uh, it's kind of funny. I, I think that uh, Platforms like LinkedIn have made a lot of the implicit things that we do physically explicit in terms of first degree connections, second degree connections. I, I do think in terms of pros, I think that there's a lot of pros in terms of uh, it, it helps it helps you ne even network while you sleep, right? Because your profile is up all the time uh, and it helps you network worldwide. Uh, it helps make great connections based on common interests. Um, and um, in terms of cons, sometimes you need to make sure that it's balanced and you don't get overconsumed because you, you can you can be there uh, indefinitely. It can be uh, addictive, so make sure that make make sure that you keep keep a proper balance uh, and uh, that you know we're all dealing some now in the time of COVID uh, with like Zoom fatigue sometimes, right? Uh, so uh, it's actually healthy sometimes to just have a phone call instead of a if, of a video conference call. Uh, and sometimes once we can, it's good to have face to face uh, as well. I do think that the world, uh, I do think that this has been a great social experiment uh, all this time of COVID and that it has shown that we can do a lot more digitally than sometimes we thought we could. Uh, so, and I think a lot of that it's here to stay beyond COVID. So I, I, I do think that there's a lot more pros on digital networking than what a lot of people thought about, but of course it cannot replace uh, being able to be Together. I mean, even though video conference is very good, uh, it's not exactly real time. There's some delay, so that also creates a little bit of dissonance between uh, what we see and uh, what we hear. And it doesn't really help you understand all the visual cues about someone's face reaction and so on as in person. Um, but I think I, it's still good enough for a lot of things. Uh, so uh, going back to, to specifically the question, I see a lot more pros uh, than cons in terms of digital. Uh, and I also think it's going to be a hybrid, right? I mean, a lot of times I I have a call with somebody new and, you know, the, the first thing I do even before the call is research them online a little bit, right? Just to make sure I have some background and see some common things that we can talk about. Okay. I know that they, it, there may be no more questions, but, it, you know, if anybody has some other comments or thoughts to share, uh, I, I, I welcome this to be a conversation as well. I make a last question. So, like in job interviews, like they always ask you, where do you see yourself in X amount of years? But like, how did you see yourself just when you started your career or when you graduated or and when you decided to study in the US? Like what was going through your mind and what, what were your projects at that moment? And how did you get from there to here? Okay, so a couple comments there. I'm sure that five years ago, when somebody got asked, where do you see yourself in five years? We never would have said anything about being right here, right now with COVID and everything else. So life happens while you're making plans. Um, in terms of, an, in a way, I, you know, the, the vision that I have for myself when I graduated ORT uh, has stayed the same, but in a, lot way, in a lot of ways it has changed because I, there were a lot of things I didn't know and that I keep learning along the way. So uh, what I can tell you is when I graduated ORT, I, I knew I had a good tool set. Honestly, I didn't know how good a tool set is, it was. I, I felt that every school was the same, but then when you go into university, you realize that the education you get at ORT uh, was much better than other schools. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you some specific examples. I mean, I, know, I knew how to uh, do integrals and derivatives, right? Calculus coming from ORT that people in engineering in, in the university don't learn for the first couple of years. So, but for me, that was normal. 
So I realized that, that we have a lot of great education that sometimes we don't value what we are uh, in our high school years, in, in, in that sense. Um, I, di I did know that I wanted to go beyond just being in front of the computer all the time, which by the way, we still are in front of the computer all the time, but I just didn't want to be like coding all the time. But I, but I felt like that thinking has helped me. And honestly, I still work in technology and I love it. I love being a builder, uh, but I'm just doing it from a different perspective. So um, I, knew, I, I knew that would help me and I knew that I wanted to do, to make, I wanted to use my skills for construction, not destruction. Uh, and I knew I wanted to uh, make things better, which is why I chose uh, industrial systems engineering. Now, other than that, I mean, I didn't know as much about business as, uh, as I ended up learning later. Um, and so, I mean, I, I was also open to see what else is out there, right? I mean, because you, you I think we need to be humble enough to, to see that we don't know what we don't know. And sometimes when we are a senior in high school, we think we know everything uh, and we really don't. So we open to learning. It's oh, always keep learning, continuous learning. By the way, I have I, I I'm getting a lot of courses right now from either younger people or interns that are teaching me Snapchat and TikTok, for example. So can I just ask you, Leandro? Uh, do, do you when you talk about lifelong learning, do you continue to take professional courses like from MOOCs and things like that or do you um, sort of learn from life experiences more? Different people learn in different ways and, and there's different modes of learning. While I do keep taking uh, some courses, trainings and certifications, um, I learn a lot uh, in my perspective. I, I consider myself what it's called, a, a, I would say a tracker. Right. I mean, in terms of tracking trends and so on. So I, I, I learn a lot, for example, from different conferences, going to a conference, looking at the, you know, not only the keynote speak, but different, different sessions and just walking the, the floor and understanding what people are talking about and the trends, tracking those trends. That is a way that I learn and I, and I also engage in conversations. And I feel like that has been a good way for me to learn things fast. That doesn't mean that that works for everybody. There's a lot of people that work better just by, uh, reading documentation, right? Uh, in terms of developers, for example, you know, um, when I'm building developer communities, the first thing I do is make sure that there's high quality documentation. So I, I do understand that different pe people learn in different ways. For me, yes, I learn a lot from interactions with other people and that actually gets my juices running. We did get another question. Um, although you are already working a great deal in the online environment, how easy has it been for you to adapt to the current COVID-19 in terms of your dealings being so online heavy or exclusively online? Were you able to quickly adapt to this new reality? So the short answer is yes. In my case, I was able to quickly adapt. Honestly, it made my life easier. Uh, I, uh, the commutes in the Bay Area have become awful. You know, what, I, I moved here 10 years ago, a trip that would take me 45 minutes uh, 10 years ago it would take me two hours, two hours and a half now due to traffic. Um, a, a lot of things I had to travel for before, uh, now I don't. Uh, so in that sense, it has made me much more efficient in terms of use of my time. Um, yes, it's not the same. I miss the the person-to-person -person interaction. It's not the same to have a Zoom meeting that actually have a lunch meeting or a coffee. Um, I, I do think that sometimes, uh, sometimes, we have a lot more back and forth and things are slower this way than when, even if it would take me two hours to go to a meeting, have a one hour meeting and come back for two hours, that sometimes could be a most more efficient use of time than all the emails book back and forth going for two weeks to try to solve something. Um, but we can still make it work. And sometimes when you have so many emails or so many Slack messages, we just hop on a quick video call and that also helps. So uh, I do think as, as I have progressed in my career and you know, also leading global teams, I, I realized that a, 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 lot of the, a, a lot of the questions are people questions and communication questions uh, in, in, in the end. So it's kind of funny. One of, um, one, of the, one of the classes that we don't have at ORT or that we don't have even at, like, that, that I didn't pay enough attention uh, during, 
during my Yale MBA, and, and I wish I, I, I did. And everybody that came said that. And at that point, you don't realize how important it is, is um, uh, organizational behavior, right? Or that includes communication, politics, and all, all the human to human interaction that you need to be aware of. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Leandro. We don't have any more questions sent in anonymously, and I'm not seeing any indicators um, from the audience. So um, I think uh, all that's left to be said is uh, we've learned a lot today from you. I, I certainly have, and I'm, I'm very glad that this is recorded so that I can look back and um, maybe hear something that I didn't hear the first time around. I think um, it's great to speak to an alum of or Argentina to find out about uh, what you experienced at school and how that's translated to your professional career and also how you've kind of carried on since that point. Um, we're going to be sharing this video online and we might get further questions and comments later on. Would you be open to answering questions online afterwards? Absolutely. And in the last slide, I, I also put my, my Twitter handle. Feel free to you know follow me, you know message me there. Um, or reach out to me directly, uh, or reach out to me through ORT. Uh, you have my contact info as well. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the questions and for a great conversation. Um, and stay safe out there.